Hello, I'm Mel Nathan. I'm Guy Three from Menon. Welcome. Welcome to Med News Week Conference, where we feature presentations by Medicine's Global Leaders. Today, we have an amazing keynote speaker in Dr. Matthew Madison. Dr. Madison is the Chief of the Division of Blood Disorders at Rutgers Health. In today's presentation, Dr. Madison discusses the latest updates in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Did you know that Dr. Madison is a globally recognized oncologist and leader who has led more than 30 clinical trials that have led to FDA drug approvals? He's also the former medical director of Memorial Sloan Kettering's Bergen branch and the recipient of multiple national awards, including the Hematology Attending Teaching Award at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and the John J. Kenny Award from the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. He's a dedicated advocate and leader in the field of oncology and clinical trials. So let's tune in. Let's tune in and learn from this great global leader. What will I try to do during our time together this evening? I'll try to give an overview of the diffuse large B-cell lymphoma landscape, talk a little bit about the, uh, the results of and impact of an important clinical trial called the Polarix trial, which was an evaluation of incorporating the antibody drug conjugate polituzumab vedotin into the treatment of patients with newly diagnosed diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. And then I'll end just with a little bit of a preview of work that, that, that we are working on trying to move the field forward uh, further. Always helpful just to frame these discussions with a case because this is about patients and not about just the science. So here's an example of a patient, 46 year old man, presents uh, without a history of comorbid illnesses. His presentation was such that he noticed painless groin adenopathy along with the relatively prompt onset of fatigue. He was under medical attention, underwent body imaging that revealed diffuse adenopathy as well as bilateral renal masses and a liver mass. Uh, he went to, to get an FDG PET scan, which demonstrated that these findings were homogeneously and quite highly FDG avid. Blood tests were performed, including a markedly elevated LDH. He was appropriately referred for a surgical biopsy of one of his peripheral lymph nodes, and that biopsy revealed a diagnosis of non-germinal center diffuse large B-cell lymphoma with a typical amino phenotype for that illness expressed in CD20, which is a marker of B-cellness. CD10 was not expressed, that's a marker of germinal center nature. MUM1 was expressed, that's an activated B-cell marker. And uh, genetic testing, FISH testing was negative for translocation of the MYC gene. So the question posed to me and thus to you this evening is, how should such a patient be treated? So to take a step back, let's talk a little bit about diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. You know, this is a, a varied audience and, and I apologize if I take some things for granted, but just to make sure that we're all on the same page, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma is the prototypical aggressive B-cell lymphoma. In the United States, it makes up about a quarter of all new diagnoses of lymphoma, making it the most common type of lymphoma in America. And we know that diffuse large B-cell lymphoma is not one disease, but rather should be thought of as a number of different biological subtypes that all get treated under this rubric, under this umbrella of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. And historically, we've subdivided diffuse large B-cell lymphoma by what's called the cell of origin, dividing it into these three relatively crude categories of activated B-cell, like germinal center diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, and then uh, primary mediastinal lymphoma as a separate entity. PMBL or primary mediastinal lymphoma really has genetically uh, a lot of overlap both between regular diffuse large B-cell lymphoma and Hodgkin lymphoma. It is really quite a different illness. But we've long known that, that at least prognostically for patients with newly diagnosed large cell lymphoma, the cell of origin does have an impact with activated B-cell phenotype conferring an inferior prognosis as compared to germinal center large cell lymphoma both in terms of progression-free survival as well as overall survival. Um, and this has been seen consistently in the literature, both before rituximab became available and, and after. It's probably fair to say at this point that we know that this classification is really crude um, and lacks nuance, so we can do better. And there's a number of different ways that you can classify diverse species of lymphoma more elegantly uh, by individual biological subtypes. And, the lymph gen classification is perhaps more popular right now, where you see that we are able to divide it into six biological categories. 
uh, that distribute it unevenly among the GCB, ABC, and unclassifiable subsets. You could also do cluster analysis. And really, as we move away from classification towards individual genetic lesions that we understand are represented in and drive the underlying disease biology by the subsets, this is where the field is going to take us as we think about increasingly uh, targeted approaches to this and other forms of lymphoma. Unfortunately, we have a lot of sophistication around the biological subsetting of patients. That doesn't always translate, at least historically, to differences in our therapeutic approach to patients with newly diagnosed diffuse or B-cell lymphoma, because at least, you know, up until last year, kind of all roads led to Rome. And if you had the ability to receive it and were an appropriate candidate for such treatment, usually you were getting treated with um, RCHOP chemoimmunotherapy with, um, with minor exceptions to that. So how do we think a little bit beyond the one-size-fits-all approach? It's worth pointing out, of course, that when we talk about RCHOP chemotherapy for six cycles, which is the historical standard, we know that there's patients who may have other approaches, and we know now quite well that patients with early stage, limited stage superior abuse lymphoma don't necessarily need such extensive therapy and very nice work done uh, previously, including by my friend Dan Persky, has demonstrated quite clearly that four cycles of chemotherapy with RCHOP is certainly appropriate and sufficient for many patients with early stage large cell lymphoma. Um, this was uh, shown very clearly as well in what's called the FLYER trial, which randomized patients who were younger, had early stage, low, International prognostic index age adjusted score and did not have bulky disease and randomized them to what was then the standard of care of six cycles of RCHOP or four cycles of RCHOP with two extra doses of rituximab. You know, editorial note nobody ever gives the extra two doses of rituximab in real life, but this was done to satisfy regulatory considerations. And what we learned from Flyer is that very clearly for these low risk early stage patients, there is really no demonstrable benefit to speak of by pushing into that fifth and sixth cycle of RCHOP chemotherapy. You could say, well, who cares? It's only two more cycles of chemo. That's not a big deal. Easy for you to say you're not the one getting it. And we also know from very nice work done uh, by my friend Talia Salt and others demonstrating that that incremental two cycles of RCHOP chemotherapy, which carries with it 100 milligrams per square of doxorubicin, does increase your lifetime risk of cardiac complications including congestive heart failure um, and cardiac morbidity and even mortality. So less is more. And if you can get away with four, give four. Other areas where the RCHOP6 one-size-fits-all approach hasn't been so um, obvious or so uh, relevant, even so true, is in care of patients who are older. We know that older patients have a uh, very different tolerance of full dose RCHOP chemotherapy. Um, and historically, we've, uh, as a country in the United States, been very heterogeneous in our approach to the care of patients uh, over the age of 80, in particular, with the B-starch B-cell lymphoma. Historically, some have said, well, we know that they can't get full-dose um, RCHOP chemotherapy, so let's, let's go light, let's not treat, or let's give um, chemotherapy without anthracycline in the form of CVP. And it's very clear that when you look at patients who are undertreated, for their diffuse RP lymphoma over the age of 80, that they really do have a worse prognosis. You can say, well, that's historical data. Maybe you're, there's some confounding there. Maybe those patients are being treated so lightly because their comorbidities are forcing the oncologist not to give definitive treatment. But even when you do the best that you can with multivariate analysis, the only thing that emerges in terms of prognostic favorable for older patients being treated for large cell lymphoma is being treated with RCHOP-like therapy. It reminds us, of course, that when we approach patients with an aggressive B-cell lymphoma, we always have to apply basic principles, which is that approach a patient as if they are curable until you know they are not curable. And if the disease is curable, and diffuse B-cell lymphoma is definitely a curable illness by definition, we have to do our best to maximize the chances of cure while at the same time minimizing short and long-term risks. So how do we go about that minimizing risks? One way that we can do this is by attenuating the dosages of RCHOP chemotherapy, administering what is colloquially known as mini-CHOP. 
Now, mini chop, as you see in the in the box here, is a lowering of standard dosages, cyclophosphamide from 750 to 400, doxorubicin from 50 to 25, and so on. This is not, in truth, a um, an underdosing of patients. And very nice work that has been done previously has shown that the actual tissue exposure in older patients, when you use these attenuated doses, is actually equivalent in terms of calculating the actual biological area under the curve for these drugs because of the changes in metabolism that are associated with aging processes, such that giving these doses is really physiologically delivering uh, appropriate and full-dose therapy. And when you give mini CHOP to patients who are over the age of 80, we see that outcomes are not absolutely terrible with a two-year overall survival of 60%, a two-year PFS of 47%. Um, this is a starting point for this patient population. What else can we do when we think about how to take care of older patients? We know that not everybody um, over the age of 80 is created equally. We know that age is, is a very poor marker for fitness or frailty. And when you look at older patients and you divide them on a basis of a simple geriatric assessment, this is not a half an hour rigorous academic evaluation. This is very quick and practical clinic evaluation that you can stratify patients prognostically quite um, stunningly into high, medium, and low risk simply on the basis of frailty reminding us that we really have to look at our older patients, not just um, at their driver's license, but actually look at the patient in clinic with you. What else can we do to make treatment for older patients easier? It is very important to remember that the concept of pre-phase chemotherapy is fundamental to care of older patients with aggressive lymphoma. Pre-phase is a way of saying to give a little bit of light treatment immediately prior to the first cycle of true induction chemotherapy. And different styles of prephase exist. Some people do prednisone alone. Some people do prednisone and a single milligram flat fin Christine. People in more resource available environments may choose to do prednisone plus a dose of rituximab. Be that as it may, it's something light. In an attempt to do a little bit of disease debulking, try to address some of the underlying disease-related symptoms and improve performance status, and by doing this immediately prior to, like a week or 10 days prior to starting the first cycle of chemotherapy, you can improve performance status, you can improve drug tolerance, and you can actually measurably improve treatment-related mortality. We often tell our patients, well, um, in the broadest of senses, there's a cumulative nature to chemotherapy. The, few, the last few cycles are the worst because it adds up. But we must also remember that the treatment-related mortality in older patients is highest with that first cycle because patients are sick from their disease. This is a new treatment and the stress to their system. So we can see that that cycle one treatment-related mortality is, is visibly uh, reduced when you're able to successfully institute a pre-phase chemotherapy program. Mini-CHOP is a standard of care for the treatment of older or frail patients. It's certainly not the only one. And one of the limitations of Mini-CHOP, of course, is that it still has age, it still has doxorubicin, which can still confer some measure of cardiac risk. And certainly we know that other cardiac comorbidities are more common as we age and seeing um, moderate to severe cardiac dysfunction in older patients with large cell lymphoma um, certainly happens. And such patients would not be eligible even for dose attenuated doxorubicin and they need other approaches. And shown here are some um, considerations that might be used for patients with impaired or frankly poor cardiac function. The one I list first is the one that I recommend most typically for older patients in my clinic, which is the RGCVP regimen. But really when you look at the data underlying each of these approaches, it's not absolutely clear allowing for the differences of cross trial comparison and the like that any one is better than the, any of the other. The top three are completely um, devoid of anthracycline in any formulation, whether infusional or, or uh, liposomal or pegylated, what have you. Other areas of controversy, even in the RCHOP is the only answer period, is this question of prophylaxis against relapse within the central nervous system. This really remains an area of unmet need and of uncertainty in, in my field. 
we've known for a long time now how to predict who's at risk for a recurrence of their aggressive B-cell lymphoma within the central nervous system, either the leptomeninges or parenchymal relapse. We know that the IPI risk factors are associated. We know that there are certain tissues that when involved confer increased risk, most notably the kidneys or adrenal glands, although testis, breast, uh, perinasal sinuses, epidural disease all confer risk as well, most likely. And when you combine those IPI factors with um, geographic involvement of the disease, you can stratify patients into low, medium, and high risk, where the high risk group has approximately 15% risk of central nervous system relapse, so a quite substantial risk. We can go beyond that system by incorporating disease biology and returning to that cell of origin construct of germinal center activated B cell that I introduced earlier in this presentation. We know that activated B cell phenotype disease is more prone to subsequent central nervous system relapse than is uh, standard germinal center to B cell lymphoma. And when you look at both that CNS IPI score from the prior slide and you combine it with cell of origin information, you can arrive at a, an even more robust prognostic model, whereas you can really identify patients who are at low or, or rather low risk and identify that subset of patients who are at that 15% heightened risk. So one thing to prognosticate is another thing altogether to do anything about it. We've known for a while that intrathecal methotrexate is, while historically a standard approach in some settings and remains an appropriate treatment in diseases like Burkitt lymphoma or even high-grade lymphoma that are at risk for early leptomeningeal progression. When you're talking about late relapse, it's most often uh, parenchymal. So we've often turned to high-dose methotrexate as our preferred approach on a practical basis. We do so admitting, and I admit to you here tonight, that the data underlying this practice is at best mixed. And there was a large multicenter retrospective analysis that was reported out looking at patients with diffuse surface cell lymphoma um, treated with R-top-like treatment all of whom had a CNS IPI score of four or greater, that 15% risk group, and looked at the patients who were offered high-dose methotrexate as prophylaxis and those that weren't. And it turned out that the risk of relapse was about the same in both groups. So what does that mean? Well, it depends on if you're a glass half empty or glass half full kind of doc. If you're an optimist, you say the docs were, must have known who's at risk. They must have been able to sense it with their spidey sense. So the fact that the group that got high-dose methotrexate was no higher than the group that did not get it tells you that we were able to successfully reduce risk. That group should have been 15% and it was only 8%. That's wonderful. Or you could say doctors don't have spidey sense. This is just the luck of the draw in terms of doctors having preferences and the groups really don't look any different. This is the challenge with respect with retrospective data is that there's unmeasured confounding that there's really no way to definitively answer such questions with such analyses. All we can say is that there's no definitive proof that it does work at reducing the risk. Um, and yet there's no proof yet that it doesn't. So we leave it to individual docs and individual patients to talk about the pros and the cons and make a choice that everyone's comfortable with. We're all keenly interested in trying to move past the we don't know, so give it your best guess approach to medicine, which is not very satisfying, either as a clinician or as a patient, certainly not as a researcher. And we're trying to move into an era where we can be a little bit more discriminating. And there's a lot of tools that are becoming available to us, at least in research capacities that could be brought to bear to this question, including work to identify cell-free DNA in the CSF. So you could imagine doing a diagnostic lumbar puncture looking for cell-free DNA as a way to biologically risk stratify patients. There's very nice work that that is prognostically very powerful. Um, whether we can use that type of insight and data to guide interventions and whether we have any interventions that could successfully reduce risk uh, remain very important questions and priorities in the field. So for the longest time, yes, older patients, we have attenuated programs. We have questions of central nervous system prophylaxis, but by and large for the majority of patients up until the most recent of days, whatever the question, the answer was our job. So the question is, can we beat it? And historically the answer has been, nope. 
There's been lots of attempts at doing so, including trying to increase the intensity or the density of treatment, give it every two weeks, then every three, give it infusional, give people a transplant afterwards to consolidate response, what have you. Those have not been successful, at least in randomized trials, they've all failed with very minor exceptions. We can try giving maintenance treatments after patients are in remission to try to improve the cure rate. Those have failed to improve overall survival. We've tried incorporating other newer treatments like antibodies or antibody drug conjugates or small molecules. And here we're starting to have the first signs of progress. So intensified regimens, as I've suggested, you know, have not moved the needle as much as we'd like. Has there been some signal that there may be progress with intensification in some situations? Yes. Uh, there's a program, instead of giving six cycles of our chop, stopping after four and changing to a different chemotherapy regimen called ICE. And when you take this one-two punch approach, at least in a single arm phase two study, it looks like outcomes are better than would have been expected. There's a very famous randomized trial that was conducted uh, in Europe comparing the RACVP regimen to RCHOP21. And it did show an improvement um, in a very small subset of patients. It was only age-adjusted IPI of equal to one. And of course, Vindesine, which is the V in that program, isn't even available in America. So while it was a positive trial, it hasn't actually uh, impacted treatment um, very broadly. The, these two programs of RCHOP ICE and RACVP are actually quite similar. Yes, it's a different Vinca, Blio is in one, not the other, but they both have similar concepts of trying to use multiple agents that are non cross resistant to try to come up with a chemotherapy program that may be, may be more comprehensive. So what else has been tried? And here we have an important study which looked at the incorporation of bortezomib into newly diagnosed diffuse structure B cell lymphoma therapy. The study is called Remodel B. And this was a randomized trial taking patients who were either activated B cell or, or, or high-grade lymphomas and randomized them to either get r plus bortezomib or r alone. This study, when it was first read out, was negative, like all the other studies. There was really no difference in overall survival by arm um, at its first reporting. Importantly, this uh, classification of patients was done on a more crude immune chemical approach and when the investigators in Remodel B went back and looked not by image of chemistry, but by molecular classification, we get a different story. And this was reported at ASH this past year, where the molecular activated B cell patients in this trial actually did have an overall survival benefit post hoc compared to the ABC patients who were treated with RCHOP alone. Similarly, although a very small number of patients, the molecular high grade patients that were contained within the remodel B patient population also experienced an improvement in overall survival compared to RCHOP. Perhaps less relevant, RCHOP is not our most favoritist program for high-grade lymphomas, um, but the ABC findings in particular are, are very uh, provocative, um, as this is the first time that we've seen improvements in overall survival in a subset of patients, post-hoc though it may be, and it certainly wants um, merits further follow-up. The conclusion of the remodel B uh, post hoc secondary analysis was that you can derive an improvement in overall survival with incorporation of bortezomib into newly diagnosed patients when you're choosing your patients on the basis of gene expression profiling as opposed to immunistic chemistry. So, are we seeing an evolution of standards? You know, for the longest time, you know, other than the advent of CHOP, of our CHOP now over two decades ago, there's really been no substantive progress um, in the field up until maybe Remodel B, and certainly the addition of polituzumab, uh, which really does, uh, for the first time, substantially challenge the RCHOP standard of care. So we have the Polar R chip program, and I'm going to talk about that. That's the Polarix trial. We have bortezomib, both in green as positive studies. Um, the red studies here are all negative, and blue are studies that are ongoing and important. 